We are so thankful that you are tuning in to watch us online today. We would love for you to do a couple of things. Connect with us in the chat and tell us where you are watching from. Share any notes or highlights that God impresses on your heart today. At the end of service, let us know if there is a next step that we can do to help you walk into. We are really excited about what God has to say today. We will get started here shortly. If you are new, please text the word hello to 573-363-4166 and fill out the information sometime during the experience. If you haven't heard, we are meeting in person again weekly, and we would like you to be here. If you would like to sign up, please go follow the link below and click on the upcoming Sunday. From there, you will have a reserved seat. Please know we are excited to have you back with us. One thing we truly value at Soma is community. And whether today is your first time or Soma has been your church for years, truly the best way to get connected with our family and start meeting others is through groups. These are so much more than quick chats or hang shakes at church. Small groups are where you can develop real and lasting friendships that go beyond Sunday morning. If you text in the loop to 573-363, 4166, we will send you to the link and get you connected to our online group. Guys, today we have the opportunity to still be part of the supporting ministry of our church. If you want to give today, you can do so here at somajc.org slash give, or you can give via text somajc at mogive.com. Thank you for joining us here today at Soma. We are so grateful we could worship together even as we are separated by distance. We would love to worship together in person. Our next worship service is Sunday at 10. If you can make it in person, we would love to meet you. If not, we will be right here as well and we can't wait to gather again. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at somajc.org and on Facebook and Instagram at somajc or text in the loop to 573-363-4166 to receive updates from the church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us. Make it a great week, guys. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Standing here, not knowing how we'll get through this test, but holding on to faith, you know that nothing can catch you by surprise. You've got this figured out, and you're watching us now. But when it looks as if we can't win You wrap us in your arms and step in And everything we need you supply You've got this in control And now we know you made a way When our backs were against and it looked as if it was over you. You made a way. And we're standing here only because you made a way. You made a way. Now we're Against the wall, 
And it looked as if it was over you. You made a way. And we're standing here only because you made a way. You made a way. When our backs were against the wall and it looked as if it was over you. stripes we are healed by his nail pierces we're free by his blood we're washed clean
Hey guys, what's up? This is Pastor John and I am so glad that you're joining us online once again as we go through the series of Colossians, the book of Colossians, we're talking about Christ being over all. Now, if you've been following along, we've been in the book of Colossians, I think your Bible's probably fallen open there, so I want you to grab it and turn to Colossians chapter 3 as we dig into what type of clothes you need to be wearing. I'm going to say the word fit today. Matter of fact, say that with me, fit. Yeah, fit. It is the clothes or the outfit that you have on right now. I'm just learning from my kids, but when I say that, I want you to know that Christ has a specific fit for you, and He wants you to put on that fit for you today. So grab your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3, and I can't wait to see you there here in a bit. It is estimated that there are more stars in the observable universe than there are grains of sand on Earth yet more atoms in a single grain of sand than there are stars in the universe. At least one native ant species can be found on every continent except Antarctica, and it is estimated that there are around 10 quadrillion ants alive at any one time. That's one million ants for every person. Plant life undergoes a chemical reaction called photosynthesis, where light is used as energy to create carbon dioxide, water, and glucose. Every living thing on Earth depends on this process to survive. The human eye 
is comprised of more than two million intricately connected working parts. And your iris has over 250 characteristics that are unique only to you. The complexity of the universe and everything in it finds its source in one person. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus, the creator of the cosmic universe, the one with absolute power and universal preeminence. Jesus, Christ above all. All right, uh, peace be with you. What is going on, Soma family? Thank you for joining us online once again as we are continuing through the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, we've been here all summer. We've been spending our time here all summer, and hopefully you're learning a lot about it. Now, I've had some questions lately about why I do the, way, the uh, preach the way I do, and I wanted to answer those up top because I just want to be honest with you. You mind if I'm honest with you? I mean, it's always good for a pastor to be honest about stuff. So I figured I'd start off. So I had somebody ask me like, hey, why don't you go more into like spiritual gifts and, and all these other stuff? And I, and I said, well, there, there's a reason I, I go through books of the Bible. And, and then this young person said, well, why do you go through books of the Bible? And I said, because you haven't read them. You probably haven't read it. And therefore, I, I want you to actually have the chance to go through the book of the Bible, know it. And then when we come across some of these more controversial subjects, then we'll cover them. And so when we get to 1 Corinthians, we get to Romans, we'll talk about spiritual giftings. But until then, we're just going to cover what God's word says now. And this one deals with something kind of fun, something I've dealt with a lot lately, which is clothing. Uh, it, it really works through what, it, what we have to do when it talks about clothing. And, and I know you guys are like, clothing, like, what are you talking about? We'll, we'll get there in just a second. But I want to give you background on this because, again, I don't think we understand all the time the background of what is going on. And in Colossians, there's a letter. Colossians is a letter. We think of it as a book of the Bible. Really, it's just a letter that Paul wrote to his guy, Timothy. Uh, um, and it, and he's, it's early in the Christian world in a small city called Colossae. Matter of fact, everybody say Colossae. Now you can tell people you know an ancient Greek world. You can say, I know ancient Greek sound. And you can sound really smart. Try it this week. So there, there, the, he wrote a letter to his place called Colossae, postmarked the whole fine yards. And Paul's letter was to these early Christians while he was in Rome. So if you don't know what happened to Paul in Rome, Paul's a Roman citizen. He goes to Rome. They promptly throw him in jail which is always good. I know we always think of like Christian saints as like the best ever. My man was in jail. He was sitting in jail waiting to hear from the magistrate to see if he had a chance to move forward. And he was there and, and he wrote the, the, the Colossians things based on things he had heard from them. And when the authorities put him in prison, Paul writes this letter from this prison and he actually is probably speaking to Timothy uh, and there's other people there that are serving as his scribe. So he really, a lot of times isn't actually writing the letter, but he's actually saying out loud to a guy who's writing it down for him. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but the Christian church in Colossae was probably about 10 years old. So a little bit older than what we are now. It was a small church, but then bad things are starting to creep in. Bad things are starting to creep in. And first and foremost, they've lost focus on Jesus Christ. They've lost focus on Jesus Christ. Everything is surrounded by Jesus Christ. They've lost focus on this and they've failed. They failed to appreciate their new identity as believers in Christ. So many of us fall into that trap. We get in there and then real quickly, we join a cause we're like, I'm a Christian, and here's a cause. No, 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 no. Jesus. Causes are a part of it. Don't get me wrong. Do, do we fight against different things? Yes, we do. But in the end, it's about Christ and him crucified. That is where our focus are. And the Colossian letter was written, uh, written to remind them over and over that, hey, you have to know that Jesus is enough. All of these other things will burn up and go away. All these other things may fail in front of you, but Jesus has to be enough. You have to continue battling against your sin and pursue holiness. Everybody say the word holiness. holiness. It's not a word that people use a lot. It's not something that we use a lot. And there's some traditions that are all about it, but I want you to know that Paul is saying you have to pursue holiness. To be holy means to be set apart. You're different. 
You're different than everybody else. You look different. I know some of us are like, I don't want to be different. But that's what he's saying. If you are in Christ, you are something different. You're setting apart. You battle against sin. You pursue holiness. And you are righteous. And you pursue your righteousness in Christ. You're distinct from the right way the rest of the world lives. Perhaps the primary purpose of this letter, and I want to throw this on the screen so you can see it, can be summed up in Colossians, uh, uh, Colossians 1, 10 through 12. We've already passed it, but I want to go back to it. It says this, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might for endurance and patience with joy. Listen, with endurance, that means you're going to endure some things, in patience, when you ask for patience, God gives you the opportunity to be patient with joy. We'll keep going. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified to share, uh, qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. At the end of Colossians 1, Paul lays out what the primary purpose is. It means to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make the word of God fully known so that you can present everyone mature in Christ. That's the reason he's writing this letter. I want you to be mature in Christ. I don't want you to keep doing this foolishness. I want you to grow in Christ. So many of us do this over and over. We talked last week about so many times where we, we, we go back to the old ways of doing things, where we quickly run back to the old ways and we find ourselves putting on that old clothes, man. And, and it's kind of it's kind of crazy. And if, if, if ministers were not doing these two things that God has called us to do, which is repenting of our sin and moving forward, then I don't know what we're supposed to do. And so He says, hey, here's the primary concern of what we have today. In our passage in Colossians chapter 3, I want you to turn your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 12. We only got a few verses to go through today. And by the way, in that black hardback Bible, if you have one, it is page 984. 984 is where it is. Colossians chapter 3. And once you find that, I want you to stand in the honor of reading of God's word. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. This is what the Apostle Paul says this morning. The word says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must uh, forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing uh, one another in all wisdom and singing psalms, uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you so much that you give us the opportunity to put on your word, to put on new clothing, to be different than the rest of the world. Jesus, I ask and I humbly pray that you help me to continue to move towards holiness, to be more like you, to grow more like you, and to be strengthened unto you. We are absolutely amazed on all that you've given us. And we need you to continue to move in our life. And we do it all for you and you alone. We ask this all in your precious name and all those things would say, amen. You may be seated this morning. If I were to sum everything up, I'm going to say today in one little sentence, our soul tattoo would be very, very simple. It's this. What clothes, or more importantly, whose clothes are you wearing? What clothes... Or again, more importantly, whose clothes are you wearing? Now, some of you guys are like, well, I'm wearing my clothes. Some of you actually are saying you're wearing your clothes and it's your mama's clothes because that's who bought it for you. But like, whose clothes are you wearing? Like, let's be honest in your life. In your life, when somebody looks at your life, what clothes are you wearing? Because when I say that, I'm talking about all Christians, not just in general, that are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and are born again in new life, but I'm talking specifically to the Christians here in this room in Soma and the ones joining us online, the ones that would be a part of our family. Whose clothes are you wearing? 
you have to ask yourself these questions because if you don't know whose clothes you're wearing, you're going to find yourself in a very precarious situation soon. So if you're taking notes this morning, the first point I have is kind of an incomplete point, but I want you'll, you'll understand it really quick. It's this. The clo- uh, clothe yourself with dot, dot, dot. Close yourself with dot, 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 little ellipses on the end. Because the idea of clothing yourself with these good virtues that Paul talks about in this passage is key. The actions complement the, the completion of taking off. Remember we talked last week, we talked last week about taking off the old person, right? We talked about taking off all the old stuff. In, in that previous passage, that Paul says, take off or rid yourself of these sinful habits, the natural things that plague you. As, as children of God, you have a new nature in you that you place your faith in Jesus Christ. But he also says, hey, once something is removed, you're not just supposed to walk around spiritually naked. You got to put something on, right? You, you got to put something on. Like the only people that we allow to run around in our households naked, I don't know about you, is, is babies, right? That's the only time that it's okay. Like if you came to my house when we had little ones, I would say, hey, you may see a naked booty occasionally because my babies would just run through the house naked and they didn't care. They don't. Now, if an adult does that, everybody has an issue, right? Somebody calls the police. There's a reason because as you grow, you understand that clothes are a part of the natural working of society. Amen. That was a good place for an amen, but y'all quiet. So we may have some nudists in the congregation online. Hopefully you said amen. Now, listen, I, as you grow, you understand that clothes are a natural part of society and that's okay. But you should put on something. You put on something. And you don't just put on what your parents had because as you grow, I remember the first time I bought myself something new. Now, listen, I remember the first time I was at Kansas State University, the great school on earth, right? I was there and I was enjoying myself and, and, and we had a party going on. I was homecoming weekend and, and I wanted to look fly. And I, I oh my goodness, I, I was the first time away from home. I was doing my thing and I wanted to go to this party and everybody's like, hey, you got to dress the nines and look good. So I went to the local mall in Manhattan, Kansas. It's about as big as the one we have here. It's, it's a small. And, and I went to the Old Navy. I don't know why I went to Old Navy, but I thought that was the flyest place to go and went there. And I got myself a turtleneck because those were in back then. I'm dating myself. Uh, I had a little chain. I had a little chain. It was a faux chain. It turned green when it went to the water, whatever. Right. Uh, I had some jeans. Now, we didn't do them in tight joints now. I don't know what y'all doing, putting baby powder on to suck in. I don't understand that. We had some baggy. You had some room to move, right? Because I'm too scared in skinny jeans. If I bend over, something's going to pop out. So like I just, uh, I had some room in my jeans, right? Like it was, it was good, right? And then just to put it all together, because it was a red turtleneck, right? Chain on it. But to put it all together, I found some red suede Tims. Ooh. Oh, those things were fire. Oh, just put it all together, right? But it was the first time that I had bought myself my own outfit with my own money that I had earned, right? I, and, and I felt like I was a grown man then. I, I had a little money myself. I had my own little outfit. I wore the junk out of that outfit. I, I, I loved having that. I wish I had a picture of it, but I don't. And I, I, I was the flyest thing on the block, right? I really thought I was the flyest thing on the block. Matter of fact, I had them red Tims until, until we got married, right? I, I still had them. I love them red Tims. <laughs> Love them thing. I didn't get rid of them. Those 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 were my first purchases. It was so good. But it's something about growing up that when you begin to buy your own stuff, it means a lot more to you. And same thing that when you grow up in your faith and you begin to put on the clothes of Christ, there's something a little bit different than your mama and daddy's faith or, or your grandmama's faith or somebody else's faith or Pastor John's faith, somebody else's faith. When you put on your own faith in your life, your own clothes in your life, it feels good. There's something a little bit different in it. You see, he says, I want you to get rid of these old clothes and be rid of all that stuff. And through Jesus, you, can re- you begin to clothe yourself in good li- uh, lives and actions as well. He gives you a list of them. He says, put on compassion. Just to define compassion, because we don't understand what that means in the world today. Compassion means to care for others and it extends to action, not pity. This is not pity we're talking about. Oh, that's too bad. No, it's love in action. That's compassion. He says, put on kindness, simply doing something beneficial to someone without analyzing whether help is needed or not. That's kindness. That's what kindness is. Opening a door for somebody. I watch my little man open door for women now. I love it. That's kindness. Giving a hug to somebody who's hurting, spending time with someone uh, instead of money. Humility. He says humility, not needing to show yourself off. I didn't have humility in that outfit. I, I didn't. I had none, like zero. But like humility is not needing to show off, but living in such a way that others take precedent in your life. Matter of fact, matter of fact, Philippians 2 and 3, well, it's on the screen for you here. It says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I love that. I love what he says right there. This is the Apostle Paul talking also there. 
But then he goes on. He says, gentleness. Now, it's funny. Uh, a lot of us always want to go, man, I want to be gentle, especially the guys. I, I ain't gentle. Listen, gentlemen, you, you should be able to have this, this monstrous side of you, gentlemen. I'm just give me your eyes for a second. You should be able to have this monstrous side of you and still be gentle. Those two work together. I, I should be able to protect my family and do everything I can as a man to protect my family, but at the same time be gentle enough to hold a baby. One of my favorite things is when uh, Aunt, uh, Aaliyah was a newborn and I was at a party with some of my friends and all the dudes were on the porch with all of our babies, holding the babies and, and tapping them. Everybody, and some people are like, oh, y'all a bunch of punks. No, no, no. I, I'm gentle enough to hold my baby girl, but at the same time fierce enough and ferocious enough to protect them. Gentleness is not something that demeans your manhood, gentlemen. I want you to hear this. So the approach to people that cares for the ultimate need for those involved and wants the best for others and it removes selfish intentions, a quiet, firm resolve to treat people the right way. That's what gentleness is. Patience, he goes on, he says patience. It's self-restraint, slow and steady approach in the face of provocation, trust rather than need for immediate resolution. Some of us are too quick to jump on somebody and go, well, I do no, 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 back off, bro. You don't have to answer everything on social media. You don't have to jump down everybody's throat. Back off, patience. Long-term gain over short-term gratification. Say it again, long-term gain. It's called a savings account, right? It's called a 401k, a Roth IRA. It's, it's long-term gain over short-term gratification. It's looking at the long game. But then he goes on, he says, forgiveness, our faith. And if you're, you're talking about the clothes and the point, these are the clothes we're talking about. Forgiveness, our faith is based on forgiveness. We receive uh, forgiveness from Christ, therefore we give and we extend forgiveness to others. If you are holding a grudge, you're not offering the same forgiveness that Christ offered you. If you are still looking at somebody going, well, that person hurt me. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Yes, what they did was wrong. Yes, they should not have done that, but that does not give you the right to hold on to it over them for the rest of the days. You can forgive them and move forward. Forgiving is letting your heart heal, not theirs. So many times, they're not even going to receive it, and that's not on them. It's for you to let it go sometimes. I think we're far too often, we look at apologies from one person. Sometimes we, there, there's these trivial things, and we do it with kids all the time, but sometimes we miss the legitimate concerns that we have to apologize over and to give forgiveness for. We need to forgive and live as well. Sometimes a situation arises when we want to extend forgiveness, but the other doesn't want it. It's about your heart at that point. There are people in my life I have forgiven that have never received it. I sleep better at night because now it's not on me. I forgive you. By the way, just real side note, don't leave the Bible over here. Forgiveness is not a one-time action. You do it over and over and over. Because there are some people in your life that you will see that irk your very last nerve. You know the one that tab dances on that one. And you forgive them. And then you see them next time and they start tab dancing again. You're like, I need to forgive you again. And maybe they don't even start tab dancing. Just their very presence irks you. You still need to forgive them. And sometimes you forgive them over and over and over. By the way, if you're like, man, pastor, how many times do I forgive him? As many times as Jesus has forgiven you for your sins. When he stops forgiving you, you can stop forgiving them. But then he keeps going. He says, love, love. The glue that holds all of our Christian fit together, right? Love is what brought Jesus to us. Love is what put Jesus on the cross. Love is what took Jesus back to the Father. Love is all these things. He says, out of all the other things, kindness, humility, all of them can, cannot, none of these can be done without love. And they come away in a beautiful way when you put them all together with there. If everything is rooted in love, oh, it all comes together. It's a beautiful thing. It's the love of Christ that makes it all work. They're simply incorruptible and unstoppable in love. So these are the fit. This is the garment that Christ really wants us to wear. These are the garments that he wants you to put on. He doesn't care one bit if we're wearing Levi or Dolce & Gabbana. He doesn't give a rip about any of that stuff. No, he, he, he says, I, I don't care if you're anti-work or not. I, I don't really give a rip about all this stuff. I want you to guard yourself, garb yourself in compassion, in love, in kindness. So many of us, if we looked at our comments online, so many of us, if we look at our comments to our brothers and sisters, so many of us, if we looked at our comments and the way that we interact with the people around us, even our neighbors would not find ourselves working in compassion kindness and love but that's what you're supposed to be marked by that's what you're supposed to be marked by think of our world right now 
Think of all the vitriol that comes on. Think of the things that we call news that are out here not spouting a, a, a lick of news, that are spouting a bunch of opinion. And all of them are rooted in fear. I was laughing because I was talking to somebody the other day. They DM me and they're like, I don't understand this from the Christian worldview. And I, and I, and I quit back. It seems like fear is, a, is the new spiritual gift of the Christian life. Because so many of us are living in fear. Oh, well, this is going to take over. Oh, but this is going to happen. Oh, but this, no, no, no. Fear is not a spiritual gift. Love, kindness, forgiveness, humility. Those are the spiritual gifts that we're supposed to live in. But those things are going to get you trampled on, I hear you saying, because I hear that same thing. No, they will not. No, we're talking about the ruler of the universe. You won't be trampled on by any means. You see, one thing I've learned by watching a lot of TV, especially this week, now the Olympics on, I'm going to spend more time watching commercials than I ever do. Right. And so uh, the Olympics are on and, and, and the fashion gurus are out there. Ralph Lauren is a, he sponsored our, our, our Olympic kits this year. And so he's out here and, and it's funny, not Ralph himself, but I'm sure the people in the fashion people are, are telling us that our garments make a statement about us. That, that's what one of the commercials told me the other night. My garments, what I wear, make a statement about us. And I agree. Jesus wants to make our lives a statement. He wants to look at your fit and make a statement about it. He says, take off the old garments and put on the new thing. What's important to the, uh, the early church, they incorpor- it was so important to the early church that they actually incorporated that into baptism. Here, here's what I, I mean. I love this. I, something I would love to maybe incorporate here. But they would walk with their old self into the baptismal pool and be baptized. And when they came out of the water, they would, they would they, I'm sorry, they would walk into the baptismal pool and would take off their old clothes, so a little bit too much for our, our society. And then they would be baptized and they'd come out of the pool and put on new garments, showing that they're taking off the old self and putting on the new self. Now, a lot of times in that society, you would wear something that would represent where you came from. Maybe you came from a cult, so you'd wear the cultist garment. Or you would come from a gang or something, you would wear the gang garments, but you would take that off on the outside, and you would step into the waters, and as you were baptized, you'd come back out, and you'd put on the garments of Christ. A lot of times it would just be a white robe over them that they would put on, symbolizing they're putting on the new self. That's a beautiful thing. Old churches represent the old life and the new life in that exact same way, and we try to do that also. But if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The Apostle Paul says, you put on those garments, I'm sorry, with what garments on? You see, fashion gurus tell us that garments have an impact on our, our actual life. They, they say, you got, these garments have an impact on your life. When you're wearing the right clothes at the right place at the right time, we feel better about ourselves, more confident, more, confident, more comfortable. We feel, you know, good. And listen, l- let me just be honest with you. There's something true about that, right? I, I, I've, I've worn some suits. I, uh, I wore a suit that uh, my wife helped me get. And we were taking pictures. I was feeling myself. And I was like, hey, looking kind of good. She had, I had the, I don't know if you guys know, I call it the Lincoln look. Where you don't look at the camera, you look somewhere way, like six miles that way, right? I had one of them pictures where I'm just kind of looking over there. I, you look like you're thinking about something real deep. You're thinking about nothing. But I, I felt like I was. I was just looking over there. Look at, I love that picture. You know, the little sepia tone. This, this looks good, right? Uh, you know, and I, I got a few of those, right? Where you put on something, you're just like, oh, that. I feel, you, you look in the mirror. Sometimes you look in the mirror a little bit too long. So there's something that the gurus have down where they say when you put on something you look good and you lost a little weight you fit back in that jacket or whatever you, it's good but if you if you're wearing garments that Jesus wants you to wear he's ready to give you by the way then you'll definitely feel a better a better about your spiritual life and how you live your life will feel better in Christ when you put on what he asked you to put on there's so many of us that are like, man, my Christian life is just kind of like whatever. I'm not really growing in Christ. I'm not really well that's cuz you haven't put on the fit he wants you to put on. Put on the stuff that he wants you to put on. Live in love and joy and compassion and live in patience and kindness. Live in those things and you'll find yourself when you put on those, it's much easier to do what Colossians 3.15, I'm gonna read it again, says. He says it right here in Colossians 3.15, he says, and let the peace, everybody say peace. peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called one body and be thankful. Do you want peace in your life? Like, do you actually want peace in your life? Because so many of us are like, I, I, I just can't get a good night's sleep. I can't, I can't. You want peace in your life? Put on the right garments. Put on the right garments. When you put on the right garments, you're going to feel so much better. One, one of my favorite things in, in our house to do is when you change the bed sheets, and, and you, you get the bed sheets down, you get that fresh 
you know, see, and, and I always, I, I'm one of those people, like, I want to put the sheets nice and tight, and I pull the sheets back, and I get the comforter up, and I get the pillows all there, so when you get in, and I always act surprised, I, I'm so goofy, I act surprised when I get in the bed I just got done making, right, so I make the bed, I slide in that thing, I'm like, ah, oh, that feels so good, doesn't it? feels good. You got to sit there and it's cool and you flip over until my dog jumps on the bed. I'm like, I'm gonna fight you. But like, it's, it it feels so good just to be in that. But why? Why does it feel so good to be in those sheets? Why do I feel at peace there? Because something has changed. I've taken the old nasty sheets that I done sweated on because it is hot right now. I've taken all that off. I've cleaned them. I've stripped them. And now I have new sheets. It's clean. It's fresh. It's something new in my life. It feels so good. You see, we are being told to keep in mind that Christ wants you to make you complete. He wants to make you complete. He wants to make you whole. He wants you to have the full meaning of peace. He wants you to be complete in him. And with Christ's love wrapped around us and other garments in in their places, we slowly become more and more and more complete. But so many of us don't even know how to put on the first garment. You got to start somewhere. Some of y'all, you might just need to put a sock on. Maybe, maybe put some underwear on. I don't know. Maybe some shorts, a t-shirt. But put something on and begin to move forward. You see, Christ's work of salvation is the entry point. And so many of us just want to stay right here. But he says, no, no, I want to guarantee your final destiny. And, that, and that's what that does. But he says, the wholeness that I want you to have, the completeness and fullness I want you to have comes by putting on these garments so that you look like I look. Wearing the garments of Christ also helps you to be thankful since we're aware of all he's done for us. That's what it says here in verse 15. So to be thankful. The more you put on the garments of Christ, the more you live like him and look like him, the more thankful to him you are that he's done this for you. You don't just sit there and go, oh, thank you, Jesus, everything. No, no, no. You say, thank you, God, that I get to wear these garments, live in this holiness, be more like you. Oh, it's a beautiful thing when you begin to live and grow and be more like him. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Last point. My Christian fit is, my Christian fit is what? Again, these fashion gurus I've been listening to this last week, especially Ralph Lauren, have told us that certain kinds of clothing will help us do certain things. I learned this week from Fabletics that uh, shorts and t-shirts are what runners wear for joggers. And that if I buy them for 12 bucks, I'll run faster according to Kevin Hart. Um, and that you know I can stretch and they have fun pockets in random places. So thank you Kevin Hart for that. I'm still not buying them, right? Because uh, the brother doesn't wear shorts. People have seen my calves, they faint. It's ugly, so I don't wanna do that, right? Um, or uh, uh, if, if, you go to, uh, um, um, if you go to certain uh, suit stores, if you get a suit and tie, right, you wear a suit and tie, then everybody is going to hire you. Women will fawn over you and you will jump on Tinder and they immediately all favored you and you will have a boyfriend or girlfriend within a week. That's what I've learned online this week. By the way, my Google search resorts are all over the place. Google thinks I'm crazy, okay? It, so that, that, that's what it is. I've also learned, ladies, I, ladies I've learned that uh, not just leggings are, are a thing now, which is weird to me, uh, that leggings are pants, but they're not. Uh, but I, I've also learned uh, that um, yeah, bike shorts are in now. So apparently bike shorts are shorts. Uh, and that's weird. Uh, but th- that's what the fashion gurus have told me. And I found out that like three years ago, they had predicted this. And now that's a thing that everybody's wearing bike shorts. We also found out in Nashville that jean shorts are back in. That's really weird. But jean shorts are back in. Um, and so, you know, I guess we're doing that because a couple years ago, it was all denim, right? And so these are all things I've learned this week. And again, my, my Google resorts all over the place. God bless my YouTube page. It's going to be ugly. They're going to suggest all kinds of fashion crap to me just in researching this. But here's the thing. Wearing the garments of Christ will help you do certain things well as well. Yes, you can wear a suit and get a job. Yes, you can wear bike shorts and, and, and leggings and you can wear shorts and run fast. You can do all this stuff. But when you wear the garments of God, uh, garments of God you learn how to dwell with God. You learn how to be in him. When you wear your Christian fit, you're you're not just able to see the Bible as a rule book because so many of us read this and go, oh, this is just a rule book. No, 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 no. It's a guide. It's a story. It's a history book. It's a record of God's love for you. That's what it is. For this world that he made, we're meant to live in God's word. We're meant to be within God's word, not just to read it, to teach. He goes on to teach and he says to help other people understand the faith. He says, you can teach and help other people simply understand it. A lot of people are never coming to church. But if you know God's word and you're willing to dig into God's word, you can help other people to learn God's word. 
Not all teachers are, are book and lecture type or sermon types. No, most of us teach with actions. Most of us teach with actions. So here's a question for you real quick. Just stop. Think of your life this last week. What are you teaching the people around you about Christ by your actions? What are you teaching the people around you through the actions that you've lived about Christ? Because you are teaching somebody. Because you may be the only Bible they ever read. So what are you teaching that? There, most lessons, if you think about it, every adult in here will agree with this statement, were learned outside the classroom. Most of the lessons that we've learned in life have been learned outside the classroom. Now, did they give me reading, writing, arithmetic? Yes, great. But there's a lot of lessons I learned outside the classroom. Common sense was not taught to me in the classroom. It's a beautiful thing. You see, Christians can teach all the time by living your life for him. He says admonish to help correct the wrong actions and behaviors of others in such a way that we're not pretending that we're better. Not pretending that you're better because you're not. But you care for them. You stand up for what's right and what God wants for them. But then Paul goes on, he says, what about singing? I love that, we can sing. Now, some of us are like, I can't sing. Great, make a joyful noise, right? But we, we sing, we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing is an expression of our heart. Our songs tell of our cares and our loves. I used to hate it. And it's funny, I find myself saying this now, so, so excuse me. I used to hate it when I would sing a song off the radio and my mama would say something like, well, I wish you knew the Bible as well as you knew the little songs. And I'm like, oh, I hate it. But what she was trying to teach me in that moment is that these songs are expression of things that come from my heart. So if I'm singing these little songs that don't sing anything about Jesus and talk about do this and do that and this, that, and the third, and I'm not be able to sing God's word, then there's an issue. Because the things that are coming out of my heart are coming out of my mouth. And that's what's in my heart right now. That's what she was trying to communicate. Paul tries to communicate the exact same thing. Now, my mama did it a little bit harsher, but it's the exact same thing he's saying. He's saying, I want you to sing to each other. I want you to have psalms. Some of you guys know how to write psalms. They're, they're Hebrew poems and stories and prayers. Some of you guys know how to write those. Write those prayers to Jesus. Sometimes they were even put to music, which is so beautiful. The book of Psalms is an official songbook of the temple, and there would have been thousands of others that he would have wrote. It's a hymnal. Like if you grew up in church, a hymnal, that's what Psalms is. And then he says in hymns, a doctrines and belief put to music to help you remember. Every week we sing a hymn. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We sing that. I do that not because it's something that is like traditional. I didn't even grow up with that in my church. I do that to help you remember basic theology in your head. I want you to have that in your heart and mind for the rest of your life. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians something very about this. He says this right here, uh, again, up on the screen for you. It says this, have this in mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as the thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every uh, tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The Apostle Paul goes on to spiritual songs, simple praise music. I know if you grew up in church, you probably heard 7-Eleven music where they have seven lyrics 11 times. You know, sometimes those aren't bad because sometimes y'all yeah, don't remember the truth they're trying to say 11 times. So maybe, maybe it's okay to keep saying over and over and over. Like we sang glory to God. Most of us don't live with glory to God on our lips. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. By the way, if you're sick of singing that, you're going to hate heaven. Because the, the angels up there talking about holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and is to come. And they keep saying it over and over. If you read Isaiah, you'll see that all the time. So, you know, people are like 7-Eleven are horrible. So, oh, y'all going to hate heaven. First million years, you're going to be like holy, 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 holy. You better get used to it. I hope you like it. We have a whole bunch of 7-Eleven songs up there. Mary and Elizabeth, if you read the scriptures, both sing after they learn God's plan for them and their com coming children. I love that. Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, after they talk to each other, and Elizabeth, uh, John is doing backflips up in her tummy, right? They sing a song. There's a whole song they sing. Adam, the first time he meets Eve, sings a song. He didn't just say, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. Then my man sings a worship song. 
He says, she fine? I don't know what he's saying. But you see something, right? He's saying something. He's saying, we better sing when we're wearing the garments to show off our Savior. We want to sing about God. We don't just have to sound good to others. No, it's not important to impress me. Please don't impress me. Impress the only audience you're singing to, which is God the Father. That's who you're doing. That's what I want you to do, to express your love and gratitude for him. The bottom line is wearing the right fit, wearing the right garments. Help us to do whatever we do, as long as it can be done in the name of Christ. So let me ask the question I asked at the beginning. What clothes, or more importantly, whose clothes are you wearing? Whose clothes are you wearing? Whose clothes are you wearing? You have the opportunity to buy your own Christian wear with the hopes, however faint they actually are, that someone might actually notice that you're wearing those sandals today. Uh, my wife sent me something the other day, said adulthood's horrible because nobody asked me today how fast my shoes are. Um, and it's true. It's true. You can do that. You can, you can, put, on your, uh, you can put on your fit and, and, and nobody's going to say anything about it. And there's so many times as Christ followers, we want to put on our own stuff. We want to buy our own stuff and then run to God and go, look, look, my shoes are fast. And God's like, nah, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really care. He says, put on my fit. Put on my gospel imprint. Put on the clothes of Christ that he already has ready for you. And sometimes you'll put them on and you're like, I don't know if this fits right. He goes, it does. The clothes that Christ has for you are already ready, are already the best quality brand. They're most durable fabric. They're everything you need them to be. They build your faith. It's not you building your faith. It's him building your faith and you relinquishing it to him. Are you willing to put on his fit? It's something a little bit different. It feels different. It might feel a little bit weird. I remember the first time I put on a new suit. I had to buy suits when I first came to Jefferson City. I had to buy suits again because I've lost a little bit of weight and I'm putting on a suit. And I remember I, I put on um, my old suit because I put all three of mine in the, uh, the dry cleaners the other day and I had to grab one of my old ones in the back of the closet. And I put that thing on and I was like, this thing, I'm swimming in this thing. And it's funny because before I even put it on, my wife was like, it's not going to fit you. I was like, no, it'll be fine. It's, it's just a suit jacket. It's fine. I put that thing on. I was like, <laughs> it was completely over me. Like I could fold it into itself. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I really have lost weight. That's, that's something different. It, it feels different. That's mass. It didn't even fit me right. I couldn't button it all day. It just looked and felt complete. It felt so odd to me. So when I got home, I, as quickly as I put it on, took it off, put it back on the hook and put it back in the back of the closet. Why? That's the old me. That's not the new me. That old me doesn't fit anymore. That old me doesn't feel the same anymore. That old me is not even comfortable. The pants weren't comfortable. They were baggy and sloughing. And I'm so glad I had a nice belt that day or else I'd have been sagging. Like I, I, it just didn't feel right as everywhere I went. Everything about it was not okay. It didn't feel, fit, look half as nice, but so many of us will grab the old self and put it on and think it looks good. Stand up in front of God and go, oh, this feels so good. And you looked goofy. Take it off. Put on the new self. Put on the new fit that fits a little bit different. That's snug and kind of goes up against you. Those clothes are the ones that he wants you to have on and they will build your faith. They will make a positive impact on others. They will ultimately bring glory back to Jesus Christ and give you the joy you are looking for in Christ. But you have to trust Christ for what he's going to give you. So whose clothes are you putting on today? So many of us have been playing the game and putting on our own clothes. And I'm going to ask you seriously, have you even considered putting on the garments that Christ has offered to you? Have you submitted your life to Christ in such a way that you can actually put on those clothes? Because maybe he hasn't offered those clothes because you're not his child. If so, today's the day that you should make that decision. And I pray that you make that decision and you come to faith in him. Matter of fact, if you don't know, Christ died on a cross for you. He was in the grave for three days, but sin couldn't hold him. He got up out of the grave, and then he rose after 40 days and 40 nights to be with his Father in heaven on the right hand, not just to give you the fit you need, but to give you all the glory and salvation you need to live your life in righteousness and holiness for all your days. That's what he offers to you. Are you willing to take that on? Are you willing to put on that fit? Are you willing to do that right now? Because if you're not, that's your choice. You keep it on your fit and looking goofy. But if you are, he offers it to you right now. 
I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, even if you're with us online. And pray with me, if you may. Most gracious Father, I thank you so much for today. That you give us a new fit. That you allow us to put on new clothes. That you allow us to take off those old clothes and put on something that feels different, that feels foreign, but really is perfected by you. Jesus, I need you to continue to push me towards holiness, righteousness, justice, peace, patience, kindness, meekness. Jesus, I ask that you help us to continue to not just move forward, but to represent you in all things. Father God, I I know that you so many times have clothed us and given us so much. But we run back to the old self to put on the old clothes, thinking that we look fly in them when we do not. God, we need you. We need you to take our old selves and destroy them so we can live for your glory and find joy solely in it. My God, I need you to do that in my life. Help me not just to live my life in the garments I think I need, but to put on everything that you would have me to wear so that I can love and honor you. And right now, for those in this room that do not know you, Jesus, I ask that they come to a living faith of you and to begin the journey to finding out how good you actually are. We ask this all in your precious name. And all who agree would say, Amen.
As we end our time together, I want to ask you this simple question. Whose clothes are you wearing? I've asked that over and over today because I want to ask you honestly, like, whose clothes are you wearing? What clothes are you choosing to put on today? When you take off the old self and you put on the new self, or maybe you take off the old self and don't put anything on. You're like one of my babies when they were younger, just run around naked. It's not a good look. Or maybe you put on some of the new clothes, but kept some of the old clothes. It's, that outfit doesn't work. God says, I want you to take off the old self and put on the new self. So what clothes are you wearing? Whose clothes, yours or his? I wanna invite you to put on that new man, that new woman, that new person. As you go into this week to put on something that will change your life, that fit will be different in your life. I'm asking you right now to bow your head and close your eyes and let God put that fit on your body. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you are willing to take off the old self and put on the new self on us. That you're willing to put on something that feels different, but acts different. That looks so similar, yet is so different. Give us the ability to become comfortable in what you've given us. So that as we put this on, that we bring you, you glory. We find joy in all of that. God, I thank you that today, Today, you've given us the chance to follow you. And I ask for the person on the screen right now, if they have not followed you with all their heart, soul, and mind, that you give them the heart change. Not just to follow you, but to submit to you and your very will. Father God, I thank you so much that you sent your son to die on the cross, that you rose him from the grave, and that he sits at your right hand right now advocating for everyone here, including those that are watching and learning about you. Give them the strength to do it. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, if that's the prayer of your heart, if that is the prayer of your heart that you want to put on those new clothes, then I want to welcome you to God's family, and I want you to text the number below and let us know that you have made that decision and begin to follow up with you. We want to celebrate what God's doing. As a matter of fact, in a couple weeks, we're going to be doing baptisms, and we want you to be in those waters. Man, I am so excited what God is doing in all of our lives, and I hope and pray for you and you alone that He does something that will change your world. Let Him be glorified by your life, and may you find joy, and may God richly bless you this week. I'll talk to you next week, guys.